Good morning, Harold Baptist Church. It's great to be with you as we worship the Lord, look into his word together again this Sunday morning. Uh, as we begin, I would like to highlight just a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, first of all, our Samaritan's Purse shoe boxes, Operation Christmas Child, uh, those boxes are due in at the church uh, by next Sunday, November 15th. Uh, we need to get those dropped off so that we can get them to where they need to be. So thank you for doing your shopping and filling those boxes. Uh, please call us here in the church office to arrange a time to drop them off this week or bring them with you uh, next Sunday morning and we'll, uh, we'll get those to where they need to go. So thank you for participating in that ministry again this year. Uh, also, Christmas is just around the corner, believe it or not. The way it feels outside right now, it's so warm and beautiful, but Christmas is just around the corner. And on our website and on our Facebook page for our core kids, uh, we have a couple of uh, Advent resources for you and for your family to use with your children or grandchildren. Uh, Advent readings, daily readings. We have uh, activities with uh, little little boxes you can build for uh, for Christmas time as an Advent countdown calendar, and there's things you can do with that. So check that out online. But we also, through our our fellowship of churches, our family of churches, uh, we have uh, a ministry called Fair, which is Fellowship Aid and international relief and we've gotten behind them on a few projects to help around the world this past year uh, but one of the things they do at Christmas is called extending love at Christmas and they have these these little cardboard banks that you fold together and put on your kitchen table and then there's a list here from December 1st all the way through to January 6th and every day you'd simply ask your family one question and you you put some money in the box uh, put 25 cents in your bank for every time you ate today. Uh, put 10 cents eat in, in for each piece of fruit in your fridge. Uh, put 5 cents in for every pair of socks you own. Uh, if you own a bicycle, put in 25 cents. If you own more than 10 books, put in 10 cents. That kind of thing. And so every day there's something different. And it just helps us to appreciate what we have and to be aware of things that others don't have around the world and and then there's the address at the bottom for you to mail that money away in January uh, to our fellowship office and that money will go to support our projects around the world where we're helping those in need uh, we're going to do that as a family this year as well but uh, we don't have a lot of spare change laying around the house these days the way money happens in Canada right now so what we're doing is we're just going to keep a running total on the column of that page and at the end we'll put a check in the envelope and mail that away so uh, there's lots of ways to do this if you'd like to be a part of that uh, contact the church office and we'll get that material to you and you'll have that for the start of December and, and that's just again a great way to help others in need uh, now keep in mind Janet is on vacation this next week so it will take her a week to get back to you but uh, send in your messages and we'll we'll look after that and get that material to you uh, as always we have our Wednesday night prayer time on, on zoom this Wednesday night and we look forward to having you join us for that and I also want to thank you again for your continued giving uh, I, as a gift as an offering as an act of worship to the Lord and as a way of supporting this local church family and the ministries that God has entrusted to us here and around the world. And uh, we just thank you for your faithful giving that allows us to continue on uh, doing and expanding the things that God has, has called us to. Well, I'd like you to pray with me as we begin, and then we'll look into God's word together this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We are grateful to be yours and to belong to you. And we acknowledge that you are the one true living God, sovereign over the universe. You alone are worthy of our praise, of our worship, of our lives. And we thank you. We thank you for your grace to us, your mercy to us, extended to us in Christ. And we thank you for the way you meet our needs and walk with us and lead us day to day. Uh, Father, we thank you for the privilege of living in Canada and the responsibility of being your people in Canada. There are so many issues that Canadians are facing today that we as a, a nation face that are, are troublesome. And there are things that are, are becoming an increasing challenge and uh, aggressive against your people here in Canada. And Father, we pray for wisdom in how we face these things, wisdom in how we live here and in how we reach out with the gospel uh, to those around us. And Father, as we meet together today here in Canada, uh, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. And we thank you for those who have served and do serve, who have sacrificed and are sacrificing uh, to protect us, to 
uh, defend us, to, to protect the, the, the freedoms that we do enjoy, and to uh, defend those around the world that cannot stand for themselves. We, we thank you for that, and Father, we again thank you for the privilege of living in such a place. And Father, today we think of those in our church family that are grieving. We have people in our church family and in our local community that are grieving the loss of loved ones. Father, we pray for peace and comfort and strength. There are many within our church family and, and connected to our church families that, that are uh, dealing with uh, surgeries, recovering from surgeries, uh, facing surgeries, dealing with long-term illnesses. Father, we pray for your presence and your work in each of those situations. Uh, we pray that you would lift our eyes to you and help us to see your hand at work uh, meeting the needs of your people. We think of those facing financial challenges and we pray that you would continue to provide for them and, and show us how we can come alongside and help meet their needs as well. And Father, now as we gather around your word, we thank you for your word and your spirit and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we all come together now, we need to hear from you. We pray that you would work in this time through your word for our good and for your glory alone. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you remember the old game, uh, card game, table game, Tribond? The way the game worked was you picked a little card out and it had three seemingly random words and you would read these words out and the other team had to try and figure out where those three intersected. What did they have in common? How did they connect? Well, this morning I want to talk to you about two things. And at first, they might seem unrelated. And you might think, where's he going with this? And these two things are God's glory and grandma's purse. God's glory and grandma's purse. You might think, what do they have in common? Or you might say, oh, I know where this is going. You might not. You might be surprised at where God's Word takes us this morning. So I encourage you to just focus in and walk with us and see what God might have to say to each of us and to all of us as a church family. Uh, we are going through, as a church family, the chronological reading of the Bible through this year, 2020. And, and we're reading it in the order it was written. And as we walk our way through, uh, we have come across uh, two passages this week that are kind of repeats in the two Gospels in, in Mark chapter 12 and in Luke 20 and 21 uh, that, that record the same events. And I would like to look at these today and just talk about something that we've read through and take a look at maybe something we might have missed. Uh, one of the things I like about my TV remote uh, uh, Trish would say I like when it's beside me, but uh, one of the things I like about it is that uh, I can pause TV, so if I need to run up and get a snack, I can pause it and not miss anything, but we can also pause a show and look at each other and say, hey, did everybody hear that? Um, what's going on? Ask a question and then move forward. Or we can rewind and we can go back and say, now, what did they say? So we rewind, we listen, okay, did we all get that? We heard that correctly? Or we can go back and say, who is that? Look in the corner. Who's standing in the shadows there? Or as they panned across that room, what was on the desk? What are those details that we might miss as we just quickly watch, but that will be critical to helping us understand things later? And that's a really helpful thing. Well, we need to do that with God's Word sometimes. Now, Mark's Gospel moves so quickly. He is writing in short bullet points almost as he goes through the events of the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. Uh, Matthew's Gospel is like a long sweeping uh, epic. It, it is like one of those uh, long British period dramas where it starts with, you know, nine minutes of credits. Uh, like when you read this genealogy at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. When you get to Mark, Mark's like an action film. Mark, Mark begins by saying, I'm about to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, buckle up, here we go, and you're in and you're off. And away we go, and it just moves quickly as he moves along through these events. And as a result, uh, it's easy to miss some things, and so we, we don't want to miss it. Remember, we're reading our Bibles this year together chronologically, uh, not to prove ourselves to God, uh, not to promote ourselves over somebody else or others that aren't reading, but to hear from him and to see his hand at work throughout scripture beginning to end, throughout human history beginning to end, throughout creation beginning to end, to see what it is he's doing and how he's working for his glory. And, and as we do, to just grow to love him more. That's why we're reading. And so we read with the big picture in mind. But as we read along, don't race and don't miss 
certain things because as we do that in in this particular passage and in the accompanying one in Luke, uh, there's a someone here, there's a person here that we, we sometimes just see, we get a brief glimpse and we go, hey, okay, we give a quick nod to her and we say, well, she's, she's an instant hero, but then we move on to more important things. You know, we, we, we move past and forget her. But if we miss this, if we miss what Jesus is saying here, I think we're really going to have a problem with how we live, how we worship, and what we teach others about this process. And so this is important for us to understand this morning. So turn with me to Mark chapter 13. We're going to read, begin by reading the first two verses of Mark 13. These two verses say this. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. The disciples were amazed at the temple and its surroundings and, and the buildings around it, just the glory of Jerusalem. Remember, these are country guys. These are fishermen, and they've been spending a lot of times in small, small towns and villages and out walking back and forth between and on the water. Here they are in the city at the temple and, and with its surroundings, and they're just impressed and amazed. And they said, Jesus, isn't this fantastic? Look at these places. And Jesus says, the temple might look good, but what's going on there isn't good. The, the temple might have been built for Herod's glory, but it's no longer focusing on God's glory. The temple is being used for the glory of the religious leaders, not for the glory of the God they claim to worship. And so Jesus points ahead to A.D. 70, year 70 A.D., where General Titus will come in, the Roman general, and he will wipe out Jerusalem, and he'll burn the city and trash the temple, and he's also pointing, as Mark 13 takes us forward now, to the end of, of all things as well, and the return of Christ and, and the judgment of God on the world then. But he speaks also of this immediate judgment that's coming on Israel we, and on the temple and, and the surroundings. And we say, well, what's going on? Why would that be coming? Well, the way to, to determine that is to really look at the leadership there, to look at the scribes. The scribes were, were teachers of the law. They were, many of them were Pharisees. They were seen as the keepers of the law, as the protectors of the people. And those were some of the things that people thought of about these guys. And Jesus has some things to say about them. I want you to remember as we come to this passage this morning that this is after Palm Sunday at the beginning of Mark 11. After Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. When, when that parade came in, and it was quite a scene, quite a spectacle, as the people are waving palm branches, those nationalist symbols of Israel, and they're hailing Jesus as their Messiah and calling God to save them through him. And so there is some serious political tension at the time with, with the Romans who were in charge there. This is after the next day when Jesus went to the temple and cleaned out the temple of all the money changers and those selling things for the sacrifices. Remember that? He made a whip and he kicked over their tables and he chased them out. It was quite a scene and a spectacle. And Jesus was there in anger cleaning out what was going on in the temple. He said, my father's house is not to be a den of thieves. It's to be a, a whole house of prayer for all nations. So there were two things going on. The religious leaders were allowing right there on temple grounds in these outer courts of the temple, people to be ripping each other off, selling at crazy prices to make a ridiculous profit on things people were desperate to have in order to offer their sacrifices at the temple. The second problem was that that was going on in the temple courts, in the courts of the Gentiles, the outer courts. That was built specifically for Gentiles who were not just welcome there, they were invited there to come and worship the true living God. But because this was happening inside those courts, the Gentiles were pushed to the outside and they weren't allowed in. Jesus came in and said, that's not right. And he's cleaned that out. And so as you can imagine now, there's, there is political tension because people are hailing him as the Messiah, the Deliverer. And there is religious tension because he is an increasing threat to the power and position and grip that the, peop that the religious leaders had on the people. And so Jesus is gaining a name and gaining a following for himself in these days as he continues to come to the temple to teach. And, and the tensions are growing with the religious leaders, as you can imagine. At the beginning of, of end of Mark 11 and beginning of Mark 12, we see the, the uh, religious leaders, they come and they question Jesus' authority. Who do you think you are? Uh, Jesus 
then responds by speaking of the, the parable of the, the wicked tenants, the, the people that, that the prophets were sent to. And they beat the prophets and kill the prophets. And so finally he sends his son, the man sends his son, and, and they kill him. And he's clearly talking to them about the religious leaders and their response to the prophets. And now to God's son whom they're about to kill. And they are, they are beside themselves. So this is what's going on here. They're questioning his, his, his authority. Jesus is confronting them with what they're about to do, what they're planning. They want to divide people over controversy. Uh, Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Uh, Jesus, what happens at the, really at the resurrection? We're divided over that. They're trying to divide Jesus' followers so that people aren't so enamored with him. Uh, Jesus, what's the most important command? Pick just one. They're trying to divide people over controversy. And it's here, it's in the middle of all of this, that Jesus sits at the temple and teaches. And it's here that Jesus speaks about the scribes, no longer to the scribes, but about the scribes. And so I want to show you three things that Jesus does, three ways that he exposes the scribes. He, he pulls back the curtain on these guys and shows them for who and what they are. So let's look at Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 35. Mark 12, beginning in verse 35. As Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Now, Jesus is teaching here about the, the scribes, and what he's saying is the scribes are inconsistent in their teaching. They say that the Messiah is the son of David, but even in quoting scripture, they refuse to acknowledge that the Messiah will also be the son of God. Again, why is Jesus saying this? Think back to the parable he's just told them about the tenants and those that would reject the prophets and reject the son of God. See, the, the scribes, they knew who Jesus was claiming to be. And they were inconsistent in their teaching because they were determined to reject him and to lead others astray with them. The second thing he says is that they are arrogant in their living. Look at verse 38. And in his teaching, Jesus said this, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. He says they're inconsistent in their teaching because they're determined to reject the Christ. They're arrogant in their living because they're determined to exalt themselves and not the God they claim to worship. They love their titles. Don't forget the reverend. Don't forget the doctor. Don't forget... The... They love their titles. This is about me about my status and my achievements. It's about you respecting me and honoring me. It's about being recognized wherever they go as the holy man in town. It's about the awards and accolades they've achieved. It's about putting on a show. I'll do these spiritual things and pray these long, wonderful prayers for what purpose? Well, for the purpose of, of exalting myself and appearing spiritual. They're inconsistent in their teaching because they're determined to reject Jesus. They're, they're arrogant in their living because they're determined to exalt themselves and not God. And the third thing he exposes is that they are oppressive in their leading. And they're oppressive in their leading because they're determined to use people, not help them. Look at verse 41. And Jesus sat down, as Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. They were the smallest currency you could have that in those days. That was what she had. And he called his disciples to him and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, often in church circles, we make this widow the hero of the story. She is, um, she is the exalted one. She is the model giver. 
The rich people, they just gave out of their abundance. She gave everything. And if you hold anything back and you don't give everything, then you're not the model giver like her. Give till it hurts, give more, give more, give till it's gone, and then try and find even more for us. That, that's the way this passage is often taught. But as we look at it in its context, that's not what's going on. She is not the model giver. This widow is the victim of a religious scam. See, her heart is in the right place. She came to the temple to worship God. She loves God. She wants to worship God. She wants to please God. She wants to honor him. And so she comes, but she is now manipulated and intimidated by the religious leaders who have been saying to her and to those like her, you really want God's blessing? Do you really want God's favor? If you want his forgiveness, if you want to be righteous, then you must give. And the secret is that you give, and once you give, you give again. And then you give again, and you give sacrificially, and you give until it hurts, and then you give until it's gone. And if they had credit cards back then, they'd say, you keep giving after it's gone. We don't care if you go in debt. Give, 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 give. And it was about what they could get from her, not what they could do for her in serving her and leading her to the Lord. I remember when I was in high school, an old B.J. Thomas song at the time that said, it talked about using things and loving people. That's the way it's supposed to be. But how often we mix that around and we love things and we use people. And friends, when we love things and use people, that is a sinful thing. It is an offense to God. And it is, it is always trouble. It always leads to trouble. It never leads anywhere good when we love things and use people. There was a man who spoke in one of our chapels when I was in Bible college many years ago now, and I've never forgotten it. And I've actually read this quote in a couple of books about ministry over the years too. He simply said this, never, never forget, brothers, that people don't help you with your ministry. People are your ministry. And we need to remember that as, as Harrow Baptist Church, as a church family. People don't help us with our ministry. People are our ministry. Well, Jesus exposed the scribes on this day. He pulled back the curtain on what was really going on, kind of like a Wizard of Oz thing, when he exposed what was really happening. And things aren't as they appear. These guys aren't all they're cut out to be. Take a look. They're inconsistent in their teaching because they're determined to reject the Christ. They are arrogant in their living because they're determined to exalt themselves and not the God they claim to serve. And thirdly, they are oppressive in their leading because they're determined to use people for their own selfish purposes instead of helping people. Well, having exposed the scribes, Jesus then warns against them. Look at verse 38. Beware of the scribes, he says. Beware. And we know, we recognize that as a word of warning. It's a beautiful sunny weekend. If this afternoon you decide to go for a walk as a family and you're walking down the street and you see on one of your neighbor's tall fences a big sign, that black and yellow sign that says, Beware of Dog. You don't look at that and say, Oh, look at that. That's an invitation to open the gate, walk on in and pet this guy's puppy. That's not what that is. We know right away that says, Stay out, stand clear, don't come in here. Danger is on the other side of this fence. Stay away. That's the warning. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Beware of these scribes. Don't follow them. What they're doing is not about God. It's about themselves. It's not about God's glory. It's about theirs. It's not about Christ. It's about collecting their own following. They're living for themselves. And Jesus had already told his followers a couple of times. Uh, back in chapter 9, verse 35 of Mark's gospel, we read this. Jesus sat down and called the twelve, his disciples, and said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. In chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Why? What, what's the model for that? Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We're to live and serve as Jesus did. 
as sacrificing ourselves for others. He says, don't follow them because they're in this about them and they're leading you astray. They're leading you to themselves and not to God. Don't imitate them because this isn't about you guys. When you go out ministry, I'm sending you out on. This is not about you. It's about Jesus. And look at verse 40. What is the warning that comes with this? They will receive the greater condemnation. Thereafter, the greatest commendation. But instead, they will receive the greater condemnation. A word of judgment. The result of their lives, the result of their teaching, is not people embracing the grace of God, but about rather leading people to trying to buy God's favor by manipulating and intimidating others to give to them. What did the prophet Malachi say about that in verse 3? God said through the prophet, sorry, chapter 3, verse 5 of Malachi, Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Judgment is coming on those that will use people for their own purposes instead of helping them in his name. Friends, I want to point out a couple of things here before we move on, and that is this. Jesus did not come to burden people. He came to rescue them. Matthew 11, all you who are weary and heavy burden, come to me and I will give you rest. Matthew 9, Mark 6, Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He came to not burden people, but to rescue them. And it's as though Jesus is saying, here I am in the temple, and as I'm teaching you, I'm, I'm undoing the handcuffs and freeing you from these burdens that you've been carrying. But while I'm doing that, and you're watching me un unburden your hands and your wrists, it's like the scribes are on their knees on the ground, and they're putting the leg irons back on because they want to keep you bound to themselves. Well, Jesus came to rescue, not burden people. Uh, secondly, I want to remind you here that God loves a cheerful giver. Yes, he loves a cheerful giver. Scripture is full, beginning to end, of the fact that we, we have the principle of first fruits. We give God not a tip out of what's left of what we have spent on ourselves. We give God the first and best part of what he's given to us because it's from him and for him. It's still his, and we honor him this way with it. We give him the first fruits. Uh, we, we give him uh, generously. We give generously. We give sacrificially. I will, offer to the Lord, I will not offer to the Lord something that costs me nothing. Uh, we choose prayerfully what we will bring, and then we give it, and we give it joyfully, gratefully to the Lord, not grudgingly. We give generously. Those who, who sow generously reap generously. Those who sow sparingly reap sparingly, we're told. Uh, we're told that we give because it's an act of thanking God for what he's given. And so we give. And as we give, that's used to help someone else. And now they thank God for the same gift. And he's thanked a couple of times for that same provision. And, and we're told this, that we give not out of obligation, but out of gratitude to God for his grace, as an act of worship to him for who he is. We give for the good of others. We're not purchasing peace with God. We're not earning salvation. We're not achieving some kind of spiritual status here. We're giving in response to him. And we're giving for the needs of others. That's one of the reasons I like that shoebox program we do every Christmas with Samaritan's Purse. It's a great thing this time of year to take our children and grandchildren shopping and to make a list for what someone else truly needs, not a list of what I would really like. And that's a good thing. That's a good principle to get them learning. And then finally, I want to point out here in this section as well that Jesus warns us about living and leading for ourselves, about using people for ourselves, about using acts of worship for ourselves. Because if we, if we look to him, if our eyes and our ears and our hearts are focused on him, we'll follow him and lead others to do the same. But if our eyes and our ears and our focus is all on ourselves, we're going to lead others to us for our glory, not for God's, for our good and not for theirs. So Jesus exposed the scribes. And then Mark 12, chapter 12, he also warns about the scribes. And it all settles on this. He has told us that we must love God and love others. Look at verse 29. Jesus answered their question about the most important commandment. The most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. If we love God first with everything we have and everything we are, above all else, if we love God, we will find ourselves then naturally loving those that God loves. And as we work for his glory, we will also want to work and live for their good. That's what will happen. I want to point out to us today that today on TV, on the internet, on our phones, in our mail, we have to be so careful who we listen to and what even ministries we follow. We've got to be careful. There are so many scams out there, many religious, many not, but there are so many scams out there targeted specifically at seniors. Give, give more, give till it hurts, Give till it's gone, and then even after it's gone, go into debt, get out that credit card, and give, 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 give to me. And, and we try to manipulate seniors, and we try to intimidate seniors. And you want God's blessing? You help me. If you're not helping me, then what kind of person are you? You're this selfish person. No, that, that is going on out there, attacking our seniors. We want to give, you want to give to us now. You want to give to us after you die, even. Listen, friends, if you want to give to our church family ministry or to a missionary or another ministry after you've gone and make provision for that in your will, God bless you. That's great. That's a wonderful thing. It's a way to keep giving and honoring him even after you're gone. But that's up to you. It's not up to us to try and manipulate you into that. Oh, be careful. So this takes us back to the beginning of where we started this morning, God's glory and grandma's purse. When we were kids growing up, uh, our family took a a we an annual rather an annual trip to visit my grandparents and we would travel to their city and we would drive it was about four hours drive and for us as kids boy that felt like forever and and now you don't even think about that but boy we it seemed like forever and we would travel and we'd spend a few days if not a week with them and whenever we were going out somewhere whether it was shopping or out to the park or when you heard the little bell of the the daily uh, rounds of the ice cream truck my grandma would sit down in her big orange leather chair and she would sit down and she would open her purse and she would give my brother and sister and I some money. It wasn't much, but huh, it was ours. It was ours and we loved it. And we had it and we could spend it on whatever we wanted. I'm ashamed to tell you that in our childish selfishness and immaturity, do you know what we learned? You see, Grandma was giving to us because she loved us and she just loved to give to us. But we learned how to manipulate that. And when her sister, who had no children or grandchildren of her own, would come over to visit, she was like another grandmother to us, we learned how to say when, when she showed up and they were together, Grandma, thank you for giving us the 50 cents. Oh, oh, Grandma gave you some money? And she would open her purse and she'd give us another 50 well, then Grandma would say, well, hold it, and she'd get out her purse, and we knew how to get that game started. Can you imagine? Grandma gave to us because she loved us and she wanted to give, and that was a good thing. But we took her generous heart, and we manipulated it into a contest for her to keep up trying to push her to see what I could get, what we could get out of her on our own. Oh, what a terrible thing. Well, children aren't the only ones who live and act that way, are they? Oh. Many out there today even in the name of some ministries, instead of praying for God's blessing and provision for grandma, they're praying on God's blessing and provision to grandma. That's what Jesus meant when he said in verse 40, beware of these scribes who devour widows' houses. They take these widows and they milk them for all they've got and they take everything they've got and take it more and more and more. And instead of praying for them and with them, they're praying on them. Terrible, terrible thing. Friends, if we love God with all our hearts above everything else with all we've got, we will then love those he loves and we will serve them. We will live for his glory and their good. We're told throughout the Bible to provide for and care for orphans and widows, the, the, those in need. Look out for those in need. Help them. Live for the glory of God and the good of others. Live out of a heart of love for God and a heart of love for others. And so I close by just issuing this challenge to us as families, as a church family, 
as a community, friends, we, we need to stop asking, hey, is, the, is there anything else in grandma's purse that we could have? Is there anything else in grandma's purse for us? And instead, we need to come alongside and ask, is there enough in grandma's purse for grandma? Let's not use grandma's purse for our good and our glory. Instead, let's live in all things for the glory of God and the good of others. Because it is out of a love for God and a love for others that we have the proper atmosphere to truly share the good news of the gospel of Jesus, the grace of God extended to us, not because we purchase it, not because we earn it, not because we're somehow achieving his favor, but simply because he loves us and he sent his son for us. Oh, may God be pleased with the way we live and how we focus and interact as we honor him in all things and reach out to help others.